Good evening. I call the March 15th, 2023 Apple Valley Planning Commission meeting to order. First item of business is the approval of the agenda. Any changes from staff? M Madam Mayor, uh, excuse me, Madam uh, Chair and members of the commission, good evening. Uh, we, <clears throat> for you tonight, we have our, uh, a very busy agenda, but uh, on your dais or in your front of you, you have three items that are related to item number 4C, the short-term rental uh, ordinance discussion. We have a memo from Tom Wellwell, also an updated ordinance, and we plan to provide for uh, a very thorough update during our presentation tonight. We also have a email uh, with some written comments regarding the short-term rentals that we would like to, because it's a public hearing item, we'd like you to have those acknowledged for the, the record for tonight. We also would re, uh, specifically request that you move item 4B to the, the end of the agenda to number 7B, if that's if that's acceptable. Yes. Beyond that, the agenda stands as, as noted. Thank you. Commissioners? Move approval. Second. Moved by Commissioner Schindler and seconded by Commissioner Scanlon. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, the next item of business is the approval of the consent agenda. The consent agenda items are considered routine and will be enacted with a single motion without discussion unless a commissioner or a citizen requests to have any item separately considered. It will then be moved to the land use action items for consideration. 3A, approved minutes of March 1st, regular meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Diekman and seconded by, was it Commissioner Scanlon? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Sustain, nay, or uh, oppose, nay. <clears throat> Motion carries. Next item of business is number four, the annual business meeting. 4A, nominate and approve officers. Make my paper here. So next we will move to the annual business meeting, um, item 4A, where we will nominate and approve officers for chair, vice chair, and secretary. Do we have any nominations for chair? Madam Chair, I recommend um, yourself for, for Chair position. Second. Thank you. Okay, any other nominations? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Vice Chair. Madam Chair, I recommend uh, myself for Vice Chair position. Second. Any others? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next is for secretary. Madam secretary, <laughs> Madam chair, <laughs> I recommend uh, Commissioner uh, Schindler for the secretary position. Second. Any other nominations? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. So that means Chair is Jody Kurtz, mm -hmm. Vice Chair is Paul Scanlon, and Secretary David Schindler. Okay, next we are moving to number five, which is the um, public hearing for Lunds and Byerly's on sale. And I will open as soon as I find my paper. We will now open the public hearing for agenda item number 5A. The affidavit of publication for the notice of public hearing is available for inspection in the planning department. Everyone wishing to speak at this public hearing should be sure to fill out the attendance roster in the back. Include your name and your address so that accurate records can be maintained. We will begin the procedure with a brief presentation by city staff, followed by a presentation by the petitioner of the hearing. Upon the conclusion of the presentation, city staff will be asked to comment on the proposal's conformance with pertinent regulations and policies. After that, comments will be taken from the general public. Alex Sharp. 
Thank you, Chair Kurtz. As noted, this is a on-sale liquor conditional use permit for Lunds and Byerly's. Lunds and Byerly's applied for a conditional use permit for their restaurant-only portion of their store, Lunds and Byerly's Kitchen. The store is in the southwest corner of 155th and Pilot Knob Road. It's currently under construction, has been approved by Planning Commission and City Council, or recommended by Planning Commission and City Council. This is an interior site plan of the store. You last saw this uh, when Tom Loveless presented it in front of the Planning Commission for approval. The only change to the plan is the addition of the on-sale liquor conditional use permit on the east side of the building. So north is up. As you can see, the east southeast corner is where Lunds Byerly's Kitchen is located. It is a sit-down restaurant with exterior patio and upstairs mezzanine. The area for the liquor ser serving prep and food area is the area on the east side of the store, highlighted in the yellow box. As noted, it does have an upstairs mezzanine uh, that will have a outdoor deck area over the top of the patio as well. The uh, liquor is intended to be served in these areas or potentially stored in these areas at times and therefore is subject to the conditional use permit. This is an outdoor area uh, rendering of the patio downstairs. Wanted to include it to ensure that there will be a four foot fence or a four foot fence is proposed around the entire exterior, making it compact and contiguous by the liquor ordinance. Uh, one of the conditions you'll see later on is that uh, liquor ordinance must be applied for through the city clerk and approved by city council at a later date. This is a rendering of what this outdoor patio and mezzanine will look like. Uh, we received this from the applicant. I do believe they are present if you have any additional questions about what types of food or menu options that would be served. And with that, the recommend ac recommended action this evening is to uh, take public comments, close the public hearing, uh, it is a policy of the Planning Commission not to enact an item in the evening of its public hearing. However, if there are no concerns, staff is recommending a recommendation of the conditionally, conditionally use permit subject to the conditions noted on screen and in your staff report. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for Alex? Uh, Madam, is there a Commissioner? Madam Chair, Alex, is there a... I, can't tell from in the drawings, and I don't recall from previous, is there going to be um, any landscaping around the outside fence area, or does that go up to the drive? Uh, Chair Kurtz, uh, Commissioner Scanlon, I believe that it's up to the drive as shown on this rendering. As it's shown here, okay. Um, traditionally, landscaping would not be a condition, or the location of landscaping wouldn't be a condition of a patio. That's mm -hmm. They've met their landscaping requirements for the store. Okay. Sure, Thank you. Commis Commissioner Mahola. Uh, Alex, I was wondering, is the is the four foot fence is the four foot height? Is that what's required by the ordinance, or is that just what's being done in this circumstance? Uh, Chair Kurtz, uh, Commissioner Mahola, it's a standard practice for our um, exterior patio CUPs. I don't believe it's written into a state law. And I knew the fence was. I just wasn't sure if the, the height was a specific requirement. A minimum of, essentially. If they wanted to go above, they could. But uh, it's always, I took the condition from past conditional use permits for okay. this. Uh, consistent with X-Golf, consistent with Vivo, consistent with several others. Uh, not Now, um, not Vivo. Uh, now it is the tavern. tavern. Sure. But I, I used past practice to determine the four-foot height. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Pruitt? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Alex, for clarity, so sales are limited to the cafe area. Does that mean that open containers are then also limited to that area? Chair Kurtz, Commissioner Pruitt, uh, that is correct. Uh, that would be dictated more through the uh, liquor license, but uh, they will double up on each other with that. Thank you. I have a question, Alex, and maybe the applicant can ask or answer <clears throat> this, but is this says buffet then, so there is no waiting tables and stuff like that, so the alcohol will not be brought to the tables? Do they get it up in the buffet area? Chair Kurtz, I would like the applicant to sure. uh, explain that a little bit further. However, if you note in, the, in their narrative the yeah. I-Portree system, it's a self-serve system. Okay. 
So I don't know how the tables will be bust, but that is uh, similar to a beer wall or wine wall if you've seen those at other locations. Uh, you walk up with your glass, uh, you put your credit card in, uh -huh. and you pay by ounce. Okay. And then you stop, and that's what you get There's charged. a brewery like that that has where you do There's that. breweries, there are brew pubs, there are restaurants. Um, how the service of tables will be done, uh, I believe that there is busing okay. occurring, uh, but I'd want some clarification on what would be bused, what isn't. I know that um, city code for this type of restaurant does require reusable dishware, which they are providing. Um, it's more of a sit-down style restaurant. Okay. Well, was the applicant here, and would they like to come up? Hello. Hello. My name is Anissa Gerstel. I work with Lunds and Byerly's. I was asked to participate tonight. Alex, nice to meet you. Um, I'm the Wines and Spirits category manager, and so uh, within my field, I work with a lot of our different liquor licensing, our wines and spirits stores, etc. One of the things that we've done is a very similar concept at our Highland Bridge store. So a newly built store in the Highland Bridge area of St. Paul. We have an upstairs mezzanine level with food service and a contiguous wall of 30 draft lines um, in a self-contained cooler. And we're proposing an eight, a single wall of eight draft lines. Beer only, no wines and spirits at this time. The process is that as a customer, you would approach the counter, request service of alcohol, show your ID, be verified to be of age, receive a wristband, allowing you to self-pour a predetermined amount that we would work with city and, and state codes to determine the ounceage. I don't have that at the ready, excuse me. And then when you're done, the wristband allows you to check out and pay via credit card, typically. So they pay up front, don't they? They like put like, I want we 20 ounces or whatever the fact is that they put that on the band then, right? And then after that amount, they don't allow any more to go into the... That is correct. So it is controlled based on, uh, we've worked with the state on, on the requirements. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have those at the recall. Sure. But yes, the, the band is um, does restrict how many ounces are poured. And the band's algorithms also dictate based on the strength of the product being poured. So for instance, at Highland Bridge, we do serve wine and beer. And so there's a lower ounce permitted for wine, which has a higher alcohol content than some of the beers. Interesting. It's really an a interesting system, and a lot of grocers around the country are, are doing this, and so this is something that we've seen in other markets at um, Whole Foods markets, at HEB markets in Texas, and so it's, it's a family-friendly way to get guests to just linger and enjoy uh, the space. Anybody have questions for her? Sure. Commissioner Schindler. What are the hours of operation? That I don't know, Commissioner Schindler, but we will, I could, I, I'm not in charge of the operations part of it, so I apologize. But I believe our Highland Bridge location, for an example, um, closes at 8 p.m. during the week and 9 p.m. on weekends, so it's significantly earlier than the store itself. It's not a late night operation, nor is it meant to be. It's meant to really honestly be an, you know, a, a, an extension of an afternoon worker wanting to have a beer as they, as they settle into a, a couple of hours with a laptop or a family having a beverage with dinner. It's not meant to be a bar atmosphere. It's not a, um, for lack of a better term, a, a hangout spot. It's, it's meant to enhance a customer who's there enjoying the space. Thank you. My pleasure. Anyone else? Do you want to tell us about the food you're going to serve? Do you know that? That is in development. Um, I can speak to what we're doing at Highland Bridge again. Um, we serve a nice menu of some sushi, some small plates, some snack and sharing items. So there's a charcuterie board with meats and cheeses and things that's called from our deli. Uh, there is a, a warmed giant pretzel with a number of dips and, and things. Um, really beer friendly food, but not, um, there's no fryer involved. It's, it's a very um, straightforward environment. Um, some sandwiches. Um, some things that are, are ready to go. And then our food service really encapsulates that yellow colored area where the, the deli food service buffets are. And so that's meant to provide the bulk of the food. Okay. Very nice. Anybody else? Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. Thanks. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Any other questions for Alex? Chair, if I may, to address... Uh, the comment from Commissioner Schindler. Uh, looking back through past CUPs on uh, on sale liquor, I looked for those patios that would have hours restrictions. It was typically only within a distance of residential that we placed those. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this has pilot knob between it and any residential um, at greater than a thousand feet. Okay. Thank you for that. What's the pleasure of the commission? Public. Public. Thank you. I knew I was going to forget that. Do we have anybody from the public who would like to speak on this behalf? Please come to the uh, podium. No one? If there are no further comments, I will close the public hearing. It is the policy of the Planning Commission not to act on an item on the same night as its public hearing. The Planning Commission will weigh all comments and information received tonight in its deliberations at future meetings. This item will continue to appear on future Planning Commission agendas until a recommendation on the petition can be forwarded to City Council. But it is the pleasure of the Commission. Commissioner Diekman. Madam Chair, I move we recommend approval of on-sale liquor sales. Um, <laughs> for the recommendations one through three as outlined in the staff report. Second. That was moved by Commissioner Diekman, and I'm sorry, was that Commissioner Scanlon? Yes. Okay. What, um, any discussion from anybody? No? Mm -hmm. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, moving to 5B and another public hearing is Clover School of Massage. And Alex is going to get his work out tonight. We will now open the public hearing for agenda item 5B. The affidavit of publication for the notice of public hearing is available for inspection in the planning department. Everyone wishing to speak at this public hearing should be sure to fill out the attendance roster. Include names and addresses so the accurate records can be maintained. We will begin the procedure with a brief presentation by city staff, followed by a presentation by the petitioner of the hearing. Upon the conclusion of the presentation, city staff will be asked to comment on the proposal's conformance with pertinent regulations and policies. After that, comments will be taken from the general public. Alex. Thank you, Chair Kurtz. As stated, this is a text amendment, zoning text amendment. <coughs> the applicant, Green Street Speedwagon, doing business as Clover Apple Valley or Clover Life Spa, has applied for a zoning code amendment that would allow them to do a massage school in conjunction with their existing massage location. So it would not be replacing their massage location. As a reminder, the location of Clover Life Spa, Life Spa is currently at 157th and Emperor Avenue, or I'm sorry, the southeast corner of Clover and Emperor Avenue. It is located within PD zone 703, plan uh, subzone 6. Subzone 6 does not have any educational or school uses listed within the zone, therefore the text amendment was required. The applicant working with the city attorney and staff have come forward to apply for uh, a change for a school that's in association with a permitted or con uh, conditional use business. To do so, while staff was working on it, we decided not to go narrow and limit it to a massage school. And therefore, the term vocational school came out so that this could apply to a wider range of uses. The um, provisions, I'm not going to read through all of it here, but essentially the school must be accredited and it must be ancillary to the primary or permitted use. There are some additional conditions as well that were added after the definition was added to the zoning code. It can be a little bit difficult to read, and I don't want to go through every... A through F here, so I've got a highlighted uh, or short list of it. Um, again, that ancillary plus complementary. There are square foot and area requirements to it to ensure that it's smaller than the existing business. Parking must be met on site for both uses. At the same, if they are going to be at the same time, then it must be able to meet that at the same time. Uh, the hours of operation are limited to ensure that they're slightly shorter. Uh, they aren't meant for all night school or things of that nature, particularly since in zone six there is residential just to the south. The number, total number of students are limited. This is one that spent some uh, staff and the applicant spent some time on, and this was acceptable to the applicant. And then the final is that uh, all activities for the school, at least, or the educational 
activities must occur indoors. Um, the intent again was to allow for other vocational type schools, hair salons, um, uh, any kind of beautician, that type of thing could also come forward. I noted this in the staff report, but didn't have it in this presentation. This does only apply to Zone 6 at this time. It would require a future text amendment if another business, say, in the retail business zone were to come forward and seek to do that, and we would evaluate whether that was appropriate for the entire zone at that time. As Zone 6 is relatively small in nature, it only affects a handful of the properties you saw on the prior slide. Um, that evaluation had not been done citywide. The applicant is present. Uh, to answer any additional questions. But otherwise, staff is recommending uh, that action be taken on this item this evening with the items noted on the screen. Okay. Have any questions for Alex? Uh, Commissioner Scanlon. Madam Chair, Alex, um, within that area, I don't recall the hours of operation for the other businesses. Are they, do they match up with um, item D from 7.30 to 10 p.m.? Or Chair Kirch, Commissioner Scanlon, that was, it was uh, intended as a limiting hour factor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't evaluated against other businesses within the zone. Mm -hmm. It was meant to limit more of a overnight school Correct. than what it was uh, to refer to the retail operations. I. I would assume that most of the businesses within that area would be closed by around 10 o'clock, but okay. Target may remain open, for instance. I, like I mentioned, I don't recall what the, if any, limitations there were in that area, and if that was any concern to you at all? The intent of this wasn't to, uh, the intent of this wasn't to limit or compare to the retail businesses, because this is not a retail business. Correct. This was a school, and there are no mm -hmm. other similar uses within the zone. Okay. This was just to ensure that it didn't expand outside of um, and become something that was more intensive than the current uses. All right. Thanks, Alex. Commissioner Sandell. Madam Chair, Alex, um, I'm just curious about the indoors clarification on here. Um, uh, Chair Kurtz, uh, Commissioner Sandell, I, I think the intent there that we were going for was you could have an event, uh, I believe, Clover Life Spa may have done like um, trunk or tree to things in the past. That could still occur, but the actual school activity of giving a massage may be inappropriate in a parking lot. For that particular one, yes, <laughs> I agree with you. Um, but I'm just curious if this does become wider than just like this zone six, for instance, like say a mechanic or, you know, something like that. I'm just curious yep. about. Uh, Chair Kurtz, uh, Commissioner Santal, this would be one of those where that that whole evaluation of wider than zone six and this type of use was was limited to zone six. Okay. Um, if we needed to make a tweak to an ordinance as a user came forward because of something like that, it gives us the ability to evaluate it rather than being stuck already having it. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Would the applicant like to speak? Uh, my name is Todd Corbo. Um, my wife and I are the owners of Clover Life Spa. And um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have about this. Probably not, but <laughs> we're excited to have more massages. I hear that there is a shortage of them. There is quite a yeah. shortage, yes. So for this, us this to depend on them for lots of reasons, fibromyalgia and et cetera. It's a good thing to see that school coming. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the public would like to speak? Come on up. Please state your name and your address, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Tellis. I am the owner of Infinity Day Spa, uh, which is located in Fisher Marketplace, uh, 14949 Florence Trail. Thank you. Uh, I recently took over that space. It was a massage envy until 2019, where it had shut down. Um, I am also seeing that there is a shortage of massage therapists, but I am also finding that um, the schools in general are having um, contracts kind of underneath with certain um, larger massage locations. Um, I 
noticed that Clover was going to be looking into opening up a school. Um, when I opened, uh, I had people coming that wanted to come work for me from his location, and they were uh, they told me that they were forced to sign a um, uh, a non compete uh, and were afraid to leave due to the fact that he's a lawyer and they were afraid that they were going to be sued. Um, my concern with him opening up a school is that if these people are being trained under him, is there going to be some sort of um, constituents that they have to work for him? Um, I have a 13 room, <clears throat> I have a 13 room spa that I could also have people come in and be able to do practical, which is what I think we're trying to get done at this point because it seems like the city is not allowing um, people to come in and do massage unless they have a license, which is taking over a year. So for me, it's been very difficult to continue to bring in staff. Um, so I'd like to know more about what his plans are with opening up this school how he because his location is more than just a massage um, spa. It's multi spa. Mine is just a day spa. It's a massage and esthetician. That's it. So um, before this were to move forward, I'd like to see what you know his criterion is for his um, his classes and how he plans on doing the curriculum and <clears throat> being able to allow his students to be able to do practicals anywhere else other than just with with their location okay so that's my concern as being you know one of the, the other largest massage you know day spas in the area so with that thank you so, thank you thank you um would that be a question to the city or would that be a question for our city attorney or something that <clears throat> I believe I would defer to the city attorney on whether the land use would ever get into something like yeah. that. Sharon? Madam Chair, tonight we're looking at a zoning question, whether the that zone and the regulations would provide for a vocational school. The city does not license vocational schools, nor would it license a massage school. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alex, you wanna? Anybody else would like to speak? If there are no further comments, I will close the public hearing. It is the policy of the Planning Commission not to act on an item on the same night as a public hearing. Did you have your hand up, sir? No? Okay, I'm sorry. The Planning Commission will weigh all comments and information received tonight in its deliberation at future meetings. This item will continue to appear on future Planning Commission agendas until a recommendation on the petition can be forwarded to City Council. What is the pleasure of the Commission? Madam Chair, I recommend approval of a draft ordinance amending Zoning Code 155.003 Definitions and um, A28 2 permitted uses. Second. Okay, that was moved by Commissioner Scanlon and seconded by Commissioner Diekman. Any discussion? Yes. Just. <coughs> Commissioner Mapolod? I, I appreciated the concerns that were raised. Um, obviously, this is it's beyond what we're, we're doing here, but in terms of the. Um, education and training, um, you know, if it's subject to a non-compete, um, that would restrict the, the training to be used at other facilities, that's problematic, but it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. But I just want to raise that comment and appreciate the comments that were made. Do I proceed forward? <clears throat> okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Hey, okay. one more public hearing. This one will be on the short-term rental ordinance. 
We will now open the public hearing for agenda item 5C. The affidavit of publication for the notice of public hearing is available for inspection in the planning department. Everyone wishing to speak at this public hearing should be sure to fill out the attendance roster, including your name and address so that accurate records can be maintained. We will begin the procedure with a brief presentation by city staff, followed by a presentation by the petitioner of the hearing. Upon the conclusion of the presentation, city staff will be asked to comment on the proposal's conformance with pertinent regulations and policies. After that, comments will be taken from the general public. Alex Sharp. Thank you, Chair Kurtz. Uh, during the agenda portion of the meeting, we did note that there's some additional material for you available on the table. Uh, the city or the memo from the uh, city administrator, and there is additional amendments to some of the text in this ordinance. Uh, discussions were occurring um, from the city attorney and uh, multiple parties as late as today, and so some of that language has been updated um, and is available for you. On February 9th, the city administrator brought forward a item to the city council informal meeting presenting on short-term rentals and the city's current position, which is that they are prohibited. Uh, in formal meetings, the city council does not provide a direct uh, recommendation they, uh, it's an informal discussion, but they can provide some in, uh, indirect direction for staff to move forward with crafting an ordinance. We were able to do so with the city attorney, and uh, essentially what uh, they discussed was that single-family homes uh, should not be used as temporary lodging accommodations. With that, it requires, similar to the last ordinance, uh, an amendment to definitions and then amendments to specific sections. The amendment, uh, amendments presented state that uh, a home, a dwelling would be uh, no longer be a dwelling. It would be a, a short-term lodging accommodation if less than 30 days. And then there were some legacy items in code that uh, I referred to in the staff memo as well that you can see towards the bottom of that that were likely uh, from nearly inception era. And these are simply seeking to clar clarify as we move on. Um, Additionally, home occupations, we needed to amend that area of code to ensure that uh, a home occupation did not constitute a short-term rental. Again, short-term rentals are those that uh, are done for either less than 30 days or done through websites, VRBO, uh, Airbnb, that, uh, things of that nature. Additional uh, Definitions needed to be amended. This was added today. This is a, a portion of the code that you didn't see in your report. It is available for you on your table. Essentially, adding the residential district, which or amending the residential district by also backing it up with that 30 days provides for additional clarity in multiple sections of code. The accessory dwelling units are permitted within two zones within the city. They are not intended to be used as a commercial practice, and thus were also, uh, they were meant for long-term accommodation or housing accommodation as well. And as such, uh, they needed to be amended to ensure that, uh, or they have a specific section for them that needed to be amended to ensure that they were consistent with the rema remainder of code. Our staff report this evening did not, or did have a recommendation the Planning Commission could take. Oh, I'm sorry, I moved on. Uh, Past one slide. This was the one additional section added. Um, that You had this before you previously. This just simply states at the end of uh, code, basically in the housing sections, that no sh short-term rentals are permitted within the community. Staff report did note that an action could be taken. However, with new text on the table this evening, the Planning Commission still has the option to take action if they sought to. However, staff would not, uh, isn't issuing a recommendation towards that, but the Planning Commission always has an option. Uh, it's traditional that the Planning Commission not take action on an item the same night as its public hearing. I do believe there are members of the public that are wishing to speak, and as you noted, or as uh, Community Development Director noted, there are public comments that have been added to the record already. Any questions for Alex? Commissioner Maholald. Um, Is this an issue? I mean, is this, is there, I'm, I'm just wondering if this is a solution in search of a problem. I'm not, a, I mean, it, are there complaints about 
um, residences being used for VRBO or Airbnb? Is there some sort of lingering problem with with that? It looked like in the materials that there are some individuals who are advertising or promoting their homes for Airbnb or VRBO. Are we having issues and problems? or Because originally the packet talked about clarifying the ordinance, and I, I, I can totally get behind clarifying the ordinance so it's understandable. But it, I'm just wondering, this is a, a fairly common situation, and it's one that is kind of self-policing because if somebody rents a unit and misuses that unit, the, the, the owner of the unit is able to identify that person and t identify them as a problem tenant. So future people who are looking to accept a request to rent can say, oh, this person threw a party at their last place. That's not who we want. But are there, are there complaints about parties being had, you know, misuses of facilities, misuses of residences? Is there, is there a problem that is necessitating an outright prohibition of this type of situation? Uh, Chair Kurtz, Commissioner Mahold, um, back in 2017, I brought this before City Council prior to the Super Bowl. We were attempting as staff to potentially be proactive and clarify ordinance. At that time, City Council decided that we did not need the additional clarity. Um, however, since then, we've had a number of complaints. We have code enforcement cases that are currently open and pending. Uh, the cases can, uh, could potentially move forward, but the city attorney has advised that we should clarify our language prior to moving those code enforcement cases forward. So we have a, a number of these within the community. We are not proactive in seeking them out. We require a complaint to bring them forward. And when received, we, um, we have currently operated under the direction that it is a commercial lodging occurring within a residential zone. It's not acting as a residence. That is what the city attorney had advised. If the city attorney has any additional comments. Okay, I mean, I, Madam Chair, uh, Alex, um, I just, again, I, I not, not privy to like the nature of the complaints. Is it somebody that's just complaining that somebody is using the facility or is it somebody complaining about bad things happening in the neighborhood because of the rental. I, that's the thing that I don't understand. Is it somebody who's just simply concerned with not recognizing somebody in the neighborhood? Um, I, I guess, again, that's all perhaps beyond what we're trying to accomplish today, but it, I'm just not aware that this is a significant issue, but that's, I wouldn't be. I'm not getting the complaints that are filed with the city. I can? Okay. Go ahead, um, Alex. So, first of all, individual code c compliance cases are confidential. I, we are aware of some homes that have been used improperly, um, and some may just be concerned neighbors as it's bringing new people to their neighborhood frequently. Um, ultimately, that has not applied to whether we uh, enforce, because our position has been that they are a commercial operation or commercial lodging within a residential zone. So the nature of the complaint hasn't uh, driven staff one way or the other. Okay. Madam Chair, if I may add. Yes, please. So the, the city attorney's office position has been, since this issue had come up in 2017 and probably even prior to that, is that a residential district is for residents, resident purposes. For a residence and once um, a home is rented out for short term for lodging purposes or, or for travelers it that use is not residential it's commercial and so it's not a permitted use under the code also there are um, the, the issue of the city's lodging tax hotels pay lodging tax and so if it's now a commercial lodging business that is an issue as well council has decided that they want to keep residential districts residential and not allow commercial lodging accommodations sure thank you uh commissioner oh, briefly 
to that. The commercial lodging tax is collected by those agencies. It is not paid to the city. Okay. I, I did check in with that in a past issue with the city, uh, city finance director. Um, those entities are collected, okay. are collecting it. It's just not coming to a city because they are not a formal rental. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, Commissioner Diekman? Just to clarify, I understand that this being a short-term rental, uh, meaning that it's less than 30 days. We do permit longer-term rentals, 31 days or more. Uh, is that not also considered commercial? Um, if I may, Alex, yeah. Madam Chair, um, Commissioner Dietman, the, the answer to that is residence. One is using it as a residence, a home, and generally people rent month to month. Okay. Um, so that's where the 30 days, it's, you know, it's, there's 28 days in February, but there's 31 in another, so it's 30 days. Generally, it's month to month, and people will rent homes or an apartment or what have you for their residents on a month to month basis. So that's why we use the 30 days. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Alex? Commissioner uh, Schindler? Yeah, I th I, I'm kind of walking a tightrope on this one. Um, <clears throat> there's, I, I, I get that there's two schools of thought. One is how is it being used? And the other is, is it a business? If you're renting it out, it's a business, regardless. If it's for one day, I mean, you're making a profit on renting out a piece of property. So I, that's where I have a problem of saying, well, if it's a short-term rental, if it's just, you know, I, I guess I, I get the, the use, but someone on vacation is using it as a home, just like if they were at their own home. So, I mean, that's, I just, I think it's, it's just a slippery slope of, well, well, we won't call you a business if you rent it for a longer period, but if you rent it for a short period, then you're a business. Are the rental people that are renting their homes paying to the city? Are you talking long-term people, individuals that are renting a home for their home? Yes. No, that the lodging tax does not apply to someone renting their house, their home. Um, now, again, the use is, it's not, it's not about whether it's business, it's, it's about the use. The use of a single family home in a single family district. And it doesn't just apply to a single family home. It applies to townhomes, apartments, condos. Um, so it's a residential home in a residential district. The, the question is, is the use for resident purposes, residential purposes. A, a person traveling and renting a room or a home for lodging purposes, that is not their home. That is not their residence. It is not on their driver's license. It's not on their taxes. It's not their residence. It's for travel accommodations. And so at that point, it, you look at what that use is, and that is not a permitted use under single, under residential districts. So that's the distinction. I think this, <clears throat> I think a lot of stuff right now really needs to be hashed out because there's so many gray areas now. People work from home. That's their office. That's their business. It is. And so I'm just saying you can you can start to roll down this hill of all these things that technology is giving us. We have to start talking about that, I think. Attorney Sharon? That's fine. You're good. Uh, Commissioner Scanlon. Madam Chair, um, right now with rental properties in the city, they, Alex, they have to register. Is that correct? Chair Kurtz, Commissioner Scanlon, that is correct. They register with the police department. Right. And is this a situation that they would have to, or are they doing that now with these type of properties? Uh, some properties are registered with the police station. Um, that does not, or with the police, that does not necessarily inherently allow them as a short-term rental. Right. Um, to address the home occupation portion, 
home occupations are permitted. So working from home is permitted. It's the, uh, there are restrictions on home occupations. You can't use your garage for the full storage. You can't have customers parking and staff parking on the street. Things to keep the residential neighborhood, a residential neighborhood versus a contractor's spot for storing his trailers, just as a layman's example. Mm -hmm. um, the, that is why that home occupation section of code is being amended to address the short term portion of the 30 days or less as well. I just think it's time that there's, there's a discussion because we're just going to be amending stuff every other meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Uh, let's see. Residents, do you want to come up and speak? My name is Mel Homan. I currently reside here in Apple Valley with my two children. Um, I rent a room in my house for this purpose. Um, there are two points I'd like to make. The first one is that I often rent to people who are transient. They're coming to Apple Valley. They've moved for a job. I have someone right now who's a nurse who's moved from Iowa. She's come with her child. She needs to set herself up, and she wants to be in a home environment to do that. So currently, she resides at my property. She's now organized herself a townhome and enrolled her child in preschool. She was, her job is in Minneapolis, but after talking to me about the local facilities here, she's chosen to live in the Apple Valley area and be contributing to the economy here. Um, so that's one case study of the type of person I allow in my home. I'm very specific about the type of people I allow in my home. I turn people down regularly that I do not think I would be happy to have in my house. Um, and I like that I have that level of control using the app that I use. Um, so many of the people are, are people who are moving and they are stuck and I allow people to bring their dogs and cats which not many hotels allow um, so that works very well for those people and for myself and the second point I'd like to make is that I started to do this when inflation kicked in and essentially I rely on this income to pay for food costs and also pay for some of my kids' activities, such as my son doing wrestling and my daughter doing swim class at WISE. Both are located in Apple Valley, and those funds directly feed into the local economy. So for me, this is something I rely on, not a fun hobby, but that I need as income. That means that I am still able to be present with my children as a mother and work full time and not take a second job that would take me away from my kids and make my situation very complex. And also, I'm a very responsible member of the community. I have never had a disturbance in my neighborhood. I have a driveway space for those people. And they are all really wonderful, nice people going to conferences or moving to the area and just looking for that opportunity to be able to stay. If they didn't have that, maybe they wouldn't set themselves up here in this area and contribute. And most of them are working professionals who do contribute a great deal. Um, teachers, doctors, nurses. Um, so I just wanted to make the points that there is a contribution here um, and it will significantly affect me personally for it to change. Um, and I'm not sure what difference it would make if they were there 26 days or 30. A lot of people commit to one week or two weeks because they hope to get their things figured out by then. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you state your address? I'm sorry. Can you just I'm sorry. It's 6400 131st Street Court, Apple Valley. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Dusek, uh, Apple Valley resident, 25 years. Uh, thank you, Tim, for letting me know what's going on tonight. So uh, I appreciate you guys uh, taking some time to go over this. Um, Address two, please, sir. I'm probably some of the problem why this got started again. <laughs> so I asked for permission to put a house into a short-term rental. And I was clearly told it was not clear. <laughs> so part of that was like, well, let's help me understand where it works and where it doesn't. City administration has been great to work with, city council and stuff. Um, and I have to have a nice little 42-page document here from the uh, National League of Cities on all the, the pros and cons of short-term rentals. That being said, there is pros and cons. I think the, the one I kind of always want to start with and kind of bring it up to talk about is that uh, in, the, in the United States here, <laughs> property ownership includes the right to include and gain income from your property. So kind of from that foundation, 
we let people rent out our properties. So my, to be clear, I'm in favor of having short-term rentals available and monitored in Apple Valley. Like I said, 25-year resident, uh, nobody wants their neighborhoods to be degraded in any way. They want to have good, clean, all sorts of good things go in their neighborhood, so I appreciate that. Uh, but short-term rentals are a new uh, change in our society, much like you're talking about technology is changing, things are changing, there's a lot of people moving from spot to spot, and a short-term rental is a very important tool to helping people be part of the community, uh, both for vacationing people, but also for people like the young lady mentioned that are in transit between a place here and there. I believe, and I don't know this for a fact, but I think we only have two hotels in Apple Valley, and they're both swapped. Um, and if you go there, they're pretty much full of, well, the one's full of construction workers, the other one's more family so, but we really don't have much space for people to come to town. If somebody wants to come and visit the, um, the Apple Valley Zoo, they have to come in, get a, you know, expensive hotel in Bloomington, Egan, Edina, someplace else, and then they travel back and forth there. So, so there's some advantage for the tourism side of it. Um, like I said, I might have been kind of what stirred this up a little bit is I asked permission. And it, the, the, to date, and that's why where this is going on, is there was no clear definition. It was just somebody back at one time said, no, nah, I don't think we want to deal with that right now. And then it's been pushed down the road a little bit. So I'm proactive to seeing the SDRs in place. I happen to own a couple myself in Wisconsin, um, mostly because it's a more, I'll say, friendly environment for that type of business, and it works good. These are like river properties and cabin properties and things like that. Um, as a matter of fact, in the state of Wisconsin, the, the Senate made it a law that small villages, towns, um, authorities over the different properties cannot e make short-term rentals illegal because it's such a valuable part of their, their vacation model, because of their tourism, because of all that that works from. So, and that's what we find sometimes with small villages, local people say, you know what, I like it just, I don't want anybody that doesn't look like me living around me, I want it to be just the way it is. I mean, that's just human nature to a point, but I think we're, the, the world has changed quite a bit. A lot of things have happened since COVID, all these different things are going on, so I think short-term rentals are a very good thing to offer. I would include um, fine-tuning it so there is a good way to monitor it. Today, our rentals programs are very, they're very good for the honest people. Honest people come in, they do the right thing. What I want to do is make sure that we have the right paperwork in place so that the honest business person can do this as well, whether it's something to ad lib or add to their personal income just to help them out for a period of time, or if they actually want to run it more like a business model. Either way, I think there should be, the paperwork should be handled for it, should be registered. Uh, I think we need to go to the next step. I would even consider putting um, in my, in the towns of Wisconsin that I currently do everything, I pay a tax on that as well. So Airbnb, VRBO, all these companies actually collect taxes for us and then pay it to the different city and municipalities to make that work. So um, to be clear, I, I would like to see short-term rentals be legalized in town, so to speak, even though they're kind of in the gray area now, and then have a good model to manage them, make sure you got good uh, participation in the owners. The owners will self-manage these things, I guarantee you, um, and the places are usually cleaner than long-term rentals. Long-term rentals, <clears throat> we've all seen that where that can get take, carried away, and we have the, the whole term slumlord comes in from that model. This is not slumlord stuff. You want your place to look the best it can all the time. You want to have it be inviting for people. And not to get too carried away, it, the price point kind of brings a certain group of people that are more responsible to the homes. And that's self-sufficient, or that's self-beneficial to the owners of the property. So we're kind of selfish on that side of it. So we want it to look nice. We want it to look good. We want it to be good neighbors with all the, the things. So anyway. I appreciate it. You've made your point very well. Thank you for that. You did your Thank homework. You. Um, can I ask for your address, sir, please? My address? Yes. 13504 Gossamer Court, Apple Valley, Minnesota. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Any others? <clears throat> I didn't know it was going to be even twice today. <laughs> <laughs> 
Michelle Tellis. Um, my address is 13637 Duluth Circle in Apple Valley. Um, I moved here literally a year ago tomorrow. Uh, when I relocated out here, I had friends that lived here. <clears throat> and um, when I was in California, I had an Airbnb in my, I had a guest house that I utilized. And I was in Burbank. So I know what it's like in California versus what, you know, Apple Valley is like. When I purchased my home, it comes up as St. Paul. The first thing I did was look into St. Paul, and they allow short-term rental. So I filled out the application, and I sent it into Apple Valley. Um, shortly after that, and I don't know who put the paperwork together, but my house is in here. <laughs> so you see uh, the one that you guys sent out. Um, so my house is 5,000 square feet on two and a half acres. And uh, it's a beautiful property. Um, and the lower level is 2,200 square feet. And everybody that I get that comes is families. Um, they do not, someone else mentioned, there are two hotels in Apple Valley. They do not accommodate families of five, which I do. Um, I have a pool, I have a spa, I have a fire pit, I have a lake. You know, they love coming out there, and most of my people that come to visit are here to see other families or here for weddings. You know, so it's, it's a much more um, demure group of people than what I would see in California. Um, I also live alone, so it allows me to be able to interact with people in, you know, the area and not be so alone here. Um, what I did find out was... That I just pulled up today, and just uh, Burnsville, Rosemont, Lakeville, and St. Paul all allow short-term rentals. Um, I live in my house, so my house is never alone when somebody is staying there. I'm above, and they're they're in the lower level. Um, <clears throat> there's over 1,000 short-term rentals right now listed in Apple Valley. Um, there is. Uh, two hotels that we talked about um, with a maximum of four people allowed in a room and it's a single room. So um, I also allow pets and I have acres for these you know, animals to be able to run around. Um, I also pulled up today the sales and lodging tax rate for Apple Valley, which comes up, which is 10.12%, which now um, Airbnb, VRBO, they all collect that tax and then they submit it into the cities. Um, the other thing that's happened over, because I understand 2017 is when the Super Bowl was here. So yeah, you had tons of people just like we do in California. Everybody wants to come and stay and you know, disasters happen because people want to party during the Super Bowl. But that was in 2017. So you know, we're, we're way past that. Um, you know, people are coming into town looking for you know, places to live, um, not wanting to you know, have a long-term rental until they decide, you know, where they want to be. So they come out, they meet with realtors. I've had people come out and do that as well. Um, but as far as uh, the lodging rate, just the percentage alone can bring in income to this to the city for that. Um, what else was I going to tell you? I'm sorry. So, yeah, so these are what I pulled today that were all the different um, listings that are available. Um, and they go anywhere from, you know, $200 to $933 a day. So mine um, is 2,200 square feet. I rent mine out for about 250 to 300 a day, and that holds five people. So try to do that in a hotel, and it just doesn't work. Um, you know, and people are much happier because also I have a lot of land. It's very quiet. My neighborhood, um, unfortunately, I'm in a very affluent neighborhood. So I think that people just don't want anybody that doesn't fit their idea of who's in the neighborhood to be there, um, which is really upsetting for me because I'm a, I'm a psychologist and I'm also very into diversity. So we want to have other people come into our communities. And if people are trying to block that, um, does it have to do with the fact that it is a short-term rental or it is people that just don't look right? walking down the street in the neighborhood. 
ago um, because I've had I had that happen once, and it was it was really upsetting, you know, to hear because we haven't had any issues. We don't have parties. People want to rent my house out for weddings because it's so big and beautiful, <clears throat> and I'm like, I don't think I can do that because that is definitely a commercial, you know, business to do. Um, but as far as being able to do this, also I have neighbors that are seniors that you know want to have other people be able to come in that, that can help um, supplement their incomes. Um, same thing someone else had said about the, in, you know, right now with all the interest rates going up, mine's a variable. In a year and a half, my, my interest rate's going to go through the roof. And I'm not going to be able to afford my house once that happens. So by doing this, when I lived in Burbank, it paid my mortgage. So here it definitely would help with that and, you know, the bottom line is I enjoy having people come to my home and, and being able to entertain and, you know, make money at it as well and let people see what, what a beautiful town it is and why, you know, why I moved here. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else? My name's Terrence Cater, 13121 Doyle's Court, Apple Valley. Yeah, I don't think short-term rentals are great because we got one across the street and when they first started, we'd have five, six, 10, 15 cars parked at the cul-de-sac. And it's always just the revolving cars moving in and out. It's not a family house anymore. It's a commercial business. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the neighborhood was made for. We like to see you get back to a neighborhood if long-term rent, at least the same person is there because then the neighbors get to know them. This one, there's, just, there's always four to five cars coming when they rent it out for the weekend. Just a revolving line. Now, how, how would you like that for your neighbor? That's a different story. You know, short-term rental you think is good, but it's not a neighborhood anymore. It's a business. So I'm against it. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Hello. Hello. My name is Brian Eikhoff. I'm a resident at 13140 Doyle's Court. Thank you. I'm a resident and homeowner in Apple Valley. I've lived here for almost 13 years. I'm here tonight to express my support for the proposed restrictions and the short-term rentals in our city. And I have firsthand experience um, knowing what it's like to live um, next to both permanent residents and a short-term rental. For the past year and a half, the property owners next door to me have operated a short-term rental business. And by definition, it, it is a hospitality business that's listed on Airbnb. And guests are offered accommodation on a nightly basis. For me and my family, it has been a very strange, unsettling experience, never knowing who might be occupying the property next door at any time. This is in stark contrast to the other neighboring properties with long-term residents that are next door. So that said, my primary concern is with the loss of community and connectedness and the inherent instability with short-term rentals when they're open in a neighborhood. From a macro level, these businesses may appear to blend into neighborhoods, but I can tell you from personal experience that short-term rentals have had a negative impact on the integrity of our neighborhood. The best neighborhoods, I believe, are groups of people that have common interests in maintaining and improving their community they care for and look out for each other. However, the people utilizing short-term rentals rarely establish any meaningful connections with the long-term residents who live around them as they travel. While I do welcome visitors to our community to enjoy our local amenities, I urge city planners to consider other options to safely accommodate guests with less disruption to our well-established residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Don't be shy. 
<laughs> I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. That's why it took me a minute to get up. Um, my name is Natalie Humphreys. I live at 13120 Doyle's Court. Did you get the address, Brianna? Okay, thank you. Um, we decided to turn our residence into an Airbnb about a year and a half ago. Um, it wasn't an easy decision. We decided to move as my husband's office was at home. We've had four kids at home. We had three little girls all sharing a bedroom together. And so we decided to find something a little bit better fit for us. It was about the time that all four kids were going to be in school and I was considering what I was going to go back to work and do. Um, those thoughts um, were so hard to think that I wasn't going to be there for them when they got home from school anymore. I wasn't going to be able to put them on the bus and be there when they got off and help walk them home. Um, when we were thinking about making this a long-term rental, that was our initial goal. Um, the thoughts of putting somebody in there for an entire year and having the wear and tear on the house uh, made us nervous. Um, we've got a really beautiful yard with a waterfall feature in the back, and we don't know how a long-term renter is going to care for that and keep the neighborhood looking beautiful and wonderful for everybody. So we thought that maybe we could try this short-term rental um, so that we could get in there um, regularly and see how they're caring for the property. Um, and we have had a roller coaster ride. <laughs> when we first started out, um, we were a little bit nervous, so we hired a company to be a middleman for us, somebody that was very aware of what was going on. Um, and our best interest was not their best interest. They were letting anybody in without the reviews, as you spoke of. Um, these people, they are reviewed by anybody that has had them in their homes. They um, are very detailed reviews, whether they left it clean, whether they were respectful, whether they listened and followed the rules that are put forth. Um, and we have gone through a change, um, and we have seen so much progress since we did that. We are able to look at each individual person coming and um, ask them, why are you coming? Um, what are your intentions? Do you agree that you will not have more than our occupancy states? Do you agree that you will not park on the street and only in the driveway? We, we ask every single person that comes if they will abide by our rules and they all have to agree before we allow them in. We do feel like we have control um, when we do this. Um, as you were saying, People that travel, they want to have a home. They want a home away from home. And that is what we have. We have a guest book here of all the people that have stayed in our homes. And we have some really great things that have come from staying in our home. Um, this two weeks ago, we had a gathering of about eight men from Ohio University that were alumni. And this note that they left really touched us. It says, at least once a year, we try to come together. This time, it was bittersweet, as we came to visit a friend that was battling cancer. We'll continue to pray, but this is likely the last time and place where we will all be together. And for that, we thank you. We have had so many people come together as a family that can't fit in grandma's house, but grandma can't travel because she can't walk. So they come and they come together in our home and they've had Christmas in our home. They've had Thanksgiving in our home. And it's been a really beautiful thing to be able to give that home away from home to these people. They can't do that in a hotel. They can't bring three siblings together and spend time, quality time in one hotel room. They can try to go out and they can try to enjoy the zoo. But what our home offers is a place where they can gather, they can cook together, they can break bread together, they can play games, they can put the kids to bed, they can spend time with their grandchildren. And that is what has really made us enjoy what we're doing on top of teaching our children how to work. We bring our kids to the Airbnb to help us work. They do the yard work with us. They're down on their hands and knees pulling weeds with us. We are using it as a way to help our children learn how to work and have good work ethic. And we hate to see that go away. And our only option is to put a long-term renter in there that we don't know if they're going to care for our home or not. And I, we can sell. That's always an option. But um, we're going to be sad to see that go, that we can't 
have that opportunity to work side by side with their children anymore. And we can't provide that home away from home for these families anymore. And that's all I have for you. Do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? I don't think so. Thank you for sharing your story. Good evening, commissioners. Sam Humphreys, um, homeowner on 13120 Doyle's Court. Um, I would like to recognize that uh, the concerns that um, these gentlemen have brought up are recognized, and I understand those concerns. Um, as Terry mentioned in the beginning, um, and as my wife mentioned in the beginning, um, we did have a couple groups that brought in more people than they should have. And we were novice Airbnb operators, and we shouldn't have allowed that to happen. But through learning and becoming better at it, we've, we've definitely not allowed that to happen again. And it's my opinion that this can be successful if the right regulations are in place. And it's not that difficult to put these regulations in place. Neighboring communities, such as Rosemount, Burnsville, others, have those regulations in place, and it allows for these things to happen. So... Um, I, I just want to second that the value of being able to bring multiple families together can be measured. Every one of you, I'm sure, loves to gather with your families. And there are, unfortunately, a lot of people out there that don't have those opportunities or have the means to do that. And to be able to have a place to bring those people together, it's, it's awesome. It's a, it's a good thing to see. So I'm in favor of it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That's about everyone, right? Oh, yep. So, Michelle's <clears throat> um, something that I've learned because I've been doing this for a while from California, um, the, uh, the organizations that now, like VRBO, Airbnb, they have become extremely stringent on vetting. They make sure you have a driver's license. They make sure that that's who you are, that if, if anything is off, they will cancel your reservation. They did it to me. <laughs> I'm like, what did I do? You know, I, I think I had the wrong phone number or something like that. But, um, but they have really stepped up um, because, like the other couple said, where at the beginning it was kind of like this, you know, free-for-all. And over the past, you know, 10 years, there has been a real change in the climate and being able to feel secure with those organizations now, to know that when you are, you know, letting someone into your home, those are the people that are in your home. Those are the people that, if there's any been a, ever been an issue, they will not allow them to come back into their systems right. as well. So I just wanted to give you that information. And I'm just wondering, have any of you ever been in Airbnb or rented out? Yeah, especially ski. You know, you gotta go somewhere. You need a lodge. So, <laughs> thank, thank you. John Deuce again. Sorry for coming back up, but I forgot a couple things. So, as we travel, my my wife and myself, um, we travel quite often with other couples, and we don't even look for a Holiday Inn. We don't look for a Best Buy or a Best Western or whatever. We always look for a VRBO. Yeah, excuse me, old days, but. So we almost always travel that way. So wherever we go, uh, we have four grandkids and our daughters and, and significant others. If we try to go to a Holiday Inn, we need to take up like five rooms. Uh, one off, it's like everybody's been in an old hotel. They're not very conducive to family groups. So much of the stories you're hearing from these people are very realistic to us. We've seen these a lot of times. And I do understand there is definitely things that can go wrong. Whenever you got people involved, something can go wrong. But back to the VRBO, Airbnb, they are very, very good at what they do. They really hold people accountable for things. And uh, um, anyway, it's just a, it's a great way to travel. Uh, whenever we do that, like I said, if we go to Wisconsin, to Nevada, Texas, wherever we travel to, that's the first place we go. So it's... It's becoming a real live thing within the rest of the world. And like somebody else mentioned, you know, we're the only city in the area that 
disallows them at this point. So just just step away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you everybody for your comments and your stories. I'm sure we will have a little bit more to think about after this. If there are no further comments, I will close this public hearing. It is the policy of the Planning Commission not to act on an item at the same night of its public hearing. The Planning Commission will weigh all comments and information received tonight in its deliberations del at future meetings. This item will continue to appear on future Planning Commission agendas until a recommendation on the petition can be forwarded to the City Council. Thank you. Uh, what is the pleasure of the Commission? Is any motion to be made, or do we have our opinion of some work needs to be done? I think some more work needs okay. to be done. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Next item of business is number six, the land use. And this is a consider conditional use permit or drive through window in conjunction with a Class 3 restaurant, and that is Kathy. Good evening, Madam Chair, Planning Commissioners. The petitioner for this request is Hempel Real Estate and the property owner, Honey Crisp Holdings, LLC. And um, Madam Chair, the the review of Cider Ridge Marketplace, the whole development began really in 2019. Uh, the commission has seen a couple of different iterations, but we're back tonight because um, the CUP for operating a drive through in connection with a uh, class three restaurant um, lapsed. So they're back seeking to have that uh, renewed consistent with their previous approval. So they're seeking a conditional use permit for drive through window in connection with the Class 3 restaurant, um, consistent with previous, but they're asking for one little change. The property is located at 7495 145th Street, which is the northeast corner of Cedar Avenue and 145th Street. Comprehensive plan um, was approved July 2020 for the commercial guidance, and then the zoning uh, map was amended June 10th, 2021 for the planned development zoning designation. The site plan that was approved uh, is consistent with the previously approved plans, and um, we'll, we'll look into this a little bit more, but this is the site plan that's been approved for the building permit. And uh, the, during the public hearing, the petitioner was kind of uh, looking a little bit to see if maybe he should do, d d reconfigure some things, if he could get the traffic away from the north side of the site. And after reviewing it in more detail, um, what staff found is that it would be best just to leave the, the site the way it is, uh, leave the current layout. Uh, it allows for uh, being able to, to peel off if there's a long line um, and just want to kind of show uh, the, the clockwise <coughs> progression. Actually, to um, get to the, the order window, uh, the driver will actually tuck in um, around the corner of the building, which is kind of unique, and we hadn't looked at that in very deep detail pri previously. And then the pickup window is on the mm -hmm. south side of the building. Hopefully you can see that all on your monitors. Uh, the floor plan, the um, Class 3 restaurant is a coffee shop, uh, will be located on the south side of the building, about 1,800 square feet. So what's being requested? Uh, the the uh, CUP that lapsed had a starting time of 7 o'clock a.m., uh, they're asking for the city to consider a 6 a.m. start time. The public hearing for this item was held at the February 15th Planning Commission meeting. Um, pastor Tim Bubna, the uh, Hope Church pastor, said that from a, the church's perspective, they didn't have any concerns about the earlier start, start time. Uh, the Planning Commission asked that uh, staff go out and look at other um, drive-throughs 
<clears throat> coffee drive through specifically. So this is kind of a uh, uh, table just showing kind of a comparison, and we'll go through these in more detail. Um, what the petitioner is saying is they feel that they're at a competitive disadvantage um, with a 7 o'clock start time, and that's why they're requesting the earlier start. <coughs> so kind of to give you a little bit of context, this is the uh, layout as it is today. Uh, the townhome right now is about 63 feet from the corner of the church's parking lot. Um, so kind of going, and I apologize, I, in the staff report, it's going to be a little bit out of order, but um, so I'm, I'm going in my slides from furthest away to closest. So that, that's kind of the logic. So starting with Starbucks at Orchard Square, uh, the nearest residential for that is 1,100 feet. So across Pilot Knob, a good distance away. Starbucks at Cedar Avenue um, is about 351 feet uh, away from residential there across nine lanes of traffic, Cedar Avenue, 10, 12. Um, no, I exaggerate, it's about nine. Um, so heavy traffic, and we have not received any complaints at all about their 5 a.m. start time. Duncan, a relatively new uh, player in the game, is about 337 feet from the nearest residential property or home. Caribou Cobblestone, so now we're getting closer to residential, uh, is about 168 feet from a senior uh, apartment development. Um, and then from Prez Homes, about 219 feet. So which brings us back to the proposal. So the, the requested um, circulation area will be relatively similar to what it is today. So 63 feet from the nearest residential building. The order board, and this is kind of interesting, as you're going around clockwise, like we said, tucking in is about 230 feet, high level, not engineered, not CAD drawn. So please, you know, give it give it some thought that way. But uh, just to kind of give you a sense of, of the distance. And, and again, kind of that traffic circulation, that tuck in. And then last, one of the questions that kept coming up as we were looking at this was, what did we do when Caribou looked for the CUP for their other location. So we pulled out the records of that just to give you an idea of kind of the, the situation there. Um, there, the drive-through lane was about 35 feet, so quite a bit shorter distance. Uh, the order window would have been 52 feet. And if, as you recall, this is at their existing site, the Cedar Marketplace. Um, the, the circulation would have been counterclockwise, so a little bit different. Um, but should point out that Caribou came to the city, said, we know we're very close, we're going to do a noise study, and we will follow the recommendations of the noise study. So uh, one of the conditions of that approval was they had an eight-foot-tall masonry wall to help absorb the noise. So included in the Planning Commission packet is a copy of the draft resolution approving the CUP with conditions. Um, I, I'll go through the conditions really quickly, high level. Um, and what I would say is if the Planning Commission wishes to change the start time, I would advise doing that as part of a motion if, if the Commission is comfortable with that. So what we've got for draft uh, conditions, uh, drive-through service, the CUP would be valid for a year. That's actually a state law, so the city doesn't have any latitude on that. Uh, the drive-through shall be installed per the site plan September 7th. That's the one that was shown. Uh, start time that we have in the resolution at this time is the 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, 
noise headlight traffic volume emissions shall not negatively impact surrounding residential and institutional uses. That condition is saying um, if they get under operation and there are complaints, um, there may be additional um, steps that may be needed. Uh, drive through lane shall not impede or conflict with vehicular or bicycle pedestrian traffic. And then last, uh, installation of the drive through facilities, if it results in loss of parking, the overall parking has to balance. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, staff is recommending approval of the resolution uh, with the conditions one through six as previously noted. And I can stand for questions sure. if there are any. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody have any questions for Kathy? Uh, Commissioner Scanlon. Madam Chair, Kathy, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, there's no additional sound control or anything being proposed here. It's just as it was originally proposed. N nothing new. <laughs> nothing new. Um, and I've previous. not pointed out the steps that they are taking. So they are doing a six foot tall privacy fence along the north property line. Uh, they are maintaining existing mature vegetation as much as possible. Uh, some of the trees on the north side will be cleared away, but then the landscape plan is showing um, uh, uh, shrubs will be planted. So what type of material is the fence? Uh, it would be a standard, I believe. Vinyl. Vinyl. Six foot. Yep. Um, I guess the problem I'm struggling with this is we spent a lot of time on this last time when we approved this originally and now we're coming back and talking about it all the same thing again and asking or change a decision that was made previously in the reasoning for that and that's where I'm concerned and then the other thing I did I had talked to you this week about the idea that the argument was made this idea of competitive advantage which to me has financial overtones to it so the question is, really, should we be that even be part of our consideration here this evening as we take a look at this? Um, just like what you had just brought up with Caribou, I mean, I would be more apt to take a closer look at this if they were truly putting some measures in place to address what the underlying concern is, both the headlights and the sound, and that's when we did that caribou and we did a lot of work on that uh, the city did and the petitioner and to look at and they you know they showed how the sound worked because vegetation trees evergreens what have you are not going to do anything for sound control on a vinyl fence is not going to do anything either so that's where i'm struggling right now like i said we looked at this in the past and they understood what the ramifications were, or excuse me, the, the starting time was seven o'clock. And we knew that from previous. And you mean, and I don't think, there's nothing coming back here to change to revisit that. So. Commissioner Deakman. <coughs> Madam or Chair and Kathy, I, I understand Commissioner Scanlard's concerns. Uh, I have a slightly different opinion on this, and you had mentioned the nine lanes of Cedar Avenue that are probably closer to these residences than this building is. And um, I, I'm having a hard time justifying limiting the hours of service beyond what we've limited other people in the area because they're gonna be driving by to get to a drive through we approved a, a drive-through with a menu board uh, closer than this menu board. We've, we've done these things with different hours. So it seems as though even though we may have approved this at 7 a.m. previously, I don't feel it's a bad decision to reevaluate the decision and to give it a different time to start because I don't know that it necessarily has a negative impact on the residences because you're talking about a car going to the drive-through, but you're not talking about the thousands of cars going by at 45, 50 miles an hour that are probably making significantly more sound 
than a car going at 10 or 15 miles an hour through the parking lot. And it is being abated by a privacy fence and vegetation. So I'm having a hard time with, with restricting it based solely on a distance because I think we need to consider the other impacts of the road, of the fence, and, and what speed they'll be traveling at. So I would be in favor of if their recommend or if their request is to go to six, I would be in favor of supporting six. I would be in favor of supporting 530 if that's what they requested. Madam Chair, just to add a little, um, another dimension. Uh, one of the challenges of the site, again, to remind the commission, is the fact that there's a pipeline easement that's going through it. So there's no way they could construct a masonry wall. Um, uh, a privacy fence will be challenging in and of itself. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Commissioner Sandell. Madam Chair, Kathy, um, you mentioned that there could be additional steps if the noise, headlights, traffic, whatever, um, do, does become a problem. What kinds of additional steps could be implemented? Like if we were to do the 6 o'clock and it turned out to be some kind of a problem. I, I, I think one of the things that we've done on other sites is kind of being right on the site with the, um, with the business and... Um, it, it, when you're physically out there and you've got the trees and everything is set, then you know when there's a gap and could say, sure. let's do an evergreen here to help block headlights or um, something similar to that is what we've done in the past. Commissioner Scanlon. Madam Chair. Um, Excuse me, Kathy, my, my uh, thought escaped me all of a sudden. <laughs> um, it looks like uh, along here that they are doing some additional landscaping along that fence line. Mm -hmm. That's not currently there. Right. To, to enhance or to kind of shield the, the headlights, if you call it that. Yep. Um, Excuse me, there was another point I wanted to bring up, and I, I, it's escaped me. So um, It'll come back. But <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> See if I can remember it. I'm sorry. Okay. So, okay. Commissioner Schindler. Yeah. <laughs> Figured I'd weigh in. Um, I'm comfortable with, with the 6 a.m. Uh, change. And while financial gain isn't our purview here, I think treating other like businesses equally is, is would be something more of of where I would would feel that it'd be a it, it wouldn't be as, as fair of a thing. And I guess at seven, if I mean I, I guess between six and seven, my biggest concern of this whole thing was the parking lot and the way everything revolved around in the parking lot and the fact that you got to go all the way to the back of the parking lot to get around to and so my biggest concern was headlights coming in when they're coming in to go all the way to the back and then back around to the front um, that would be my biggest concern so like where that arrow points and in, in the where you're coming around that corner would be my biggest concern um, not so concerned about the noise, as uh, Mr. Diekman mentioned, <laughs> Commissioner Diekman. Um, so that would be, and and I guess if I if if, if we're confident that that there's going to be enough blockage that lights aren't going to be shining in the bedroom window, um, I'm comfortable. And and to me, between six and seven, I'd, I'd rather be more consistent with what we're allowing across the. The city for for that type of service. I mean, I got a. I know people drink coffee all day, <laughs> um, but I got to think that's probably one of your main point times is. Yes, morning, morning rush. Yep. Okay. So I, I back. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Done. Done. I back up uh, Commissioner Diekman too on that. What I do like is the fact that we can add more afterwards if there is any kind of issues that we can look at the planting or the 
shrubs and the trees and add, right? Um, so, yeah. Commissioner Scanlon, I told you to come back. <laughs> Madam Chair, Kathy, um, have you, the last time we, we talked about this, we had a number of re residents that had uh, talked to us. And did you, have you gotten any feedback from residents this time? Actually, no. Not a one. Not a one. Not a one. Nope. And um, you mentioned you walked the property the other day and that your confidence with what they're doing landscape-wise, defense-wise, is going to um, mitigate the uh, concerns with headlights, um, as, which I guess would call the main thing. Um, Commissioner Deakman brought up a good point that at that time in the morning there's probably a fair amount of traffic going by there. Um, so um, the, um, the site is quite under full construction and the underground um, drainage tubes are sitting. So it, it's not possible to really see kind of the finished grade at all. Mm -hmm. And the snow banks are sure. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think just being able to walk the site helped to, to kind of get a sense of right. Where and then the the um, um, documentation that we have in the the proposal here mm -hmm. is that adequate to address things as we move forward. If if this gets approved, that you can. Um, deal with that at the, a later date in terms of headlights, sound, or doing something to, to work with the, the, the applicant to address that at a later date? Yeah, and that's, you know, it's not a big burden. We're not coming after to, you know, it's just help us solve this problem. Right. And, and I, it's, it's worked well. In and it's not like this is their only property in right. Apple Valley. And they've got experience. Three, so. four yeah. properties here within the city so that they've worked on in the last few years. Yes. Yes. Right. Thanks, Kathy. So, Kathy, before we move forward, my guess is that we have to agree on a time. Uh, if we make a motion, and should we have the applicants speak first to see what they're... If they want to, need to. Are you, just, are you good with us grabbing a time for you? <laughs> <laughs> Eight o'clock it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that, did you? <laughs> what is the pleasure of the commission? Madam Chair, I recommend that uh, we go with the proposed six o'clock start time. Second. Okay, but we they have to go through one through six, so, right? We just we need a motion to adjust item number five to six. And then we'll make another whole motion. Okay. So a motion was made by Commissioner Schindler and seconded by Commissioner Sandal. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Madam Chair, I move we recommend approval of a CUP for drive through window service in conjunction with the Class 3 restaurant in plan development number 1087 uh, and attaching conditions. 1 through 10, as outlined in the resolution given by staff. Yep. Second. That was moved by Commissioner Diekman, and I believe that was uh, seconded by Commissioner Mahowald. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, next we go to seven, other business. Um, Mr. Tim Benetti, please discuss the upcoming schedule. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of, of the commission. You have, your upcoming meeting is on Wednesday, April 5th at 7 p.m. Also, the following month of April 19th, 2023, 7 p.m., the City Council meetings on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023, and the City Council of April 13th of 2023. And on 7B, we're going to have the Planning Commission Annual Report by Tim Bidetti. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. My first time before you. I hope I 
I hope I met all of you. If I haven't, I'm Tim Bonetti. I am the new community development director. Uh, I'd love to take a lot of credit for this uh, report that I'm about to present to you, but of course I wasn't here. So uh, fortunately for me, I inherited a great staff. I don't know if you've heard that, but I'm gonna say tonight, uh, my, my, my crack team of, of, of planners, assistants, code enforcement officials, all the other staff I've worked with so far have been outstanding, and I hope you know how blessed you are to have such a great team. And so, we do, yes. So um, if next year, if I say anything different, you'll know the honeymoon's over and things <laughs> really took a turn for the worse. But I hope they're... Plus, I want to give credit to the uh, city attorney, who is a wonderful uh, resource, phenomenal legal mind. Her and Mike have been very good to work with, so... Really appreciate their uh, assistance as well. So my thanks to Sharon yes. and Mike. Yes, thank you. Uh, before you tonight, again, I'm sure most of you are have seen these before, but listening of your commissioners uh, in front of you, uh, I want to appreciate and congratulate Commissioners Kurtz, Diekman, and Schindler for being reappointed to serve another three-year term. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, looks like you had a very busy year in 2022. You had 50 applications, land use applications. Most of those were in the subdivision or plat, uh, uh, categories. You had a number of site plan and building permit authorizations of 10, and they go down to va uh, variances of eight, one vacation, a couple of zoning or amendments, the rezonings. Again, a very busy year. I'm sure most of you are aware of our 12 keys to Apple Valley's vision. I think these are memorialized in our in our new comp plan, but they start with service, great place to live, business oriented, safe, parks. So these are some nice things that we key off of on any new development or any new principles that we bring forward to you. Some key development projects for 2022, some of you hopefully are, have been here or worked on these, Panera, Chase, Popeyes, Bones and Byerly's, the AV Mexican Market and Restaurant, which uh, our, our planner, Alex, I know worked very diligently on to get that in, floor and decor, X-Golf Health Partners, Chafin Vet Clinic, Scannell, Opus for the industrial. For residential, we, we had Eagle Point, Lakeside of Diamond Path, Pulte Homes, new townhome development, Presbyterian Homes, Applewood Point, Riser of Apple, of Apple Valley. Institutional projects such as uh, our Eagle Brook Church, the city's metro, central maintenance field facility, and our fire station number two. Again, this is a very busy map, but this is a, uh, an expected uh, development that will be taking place or currently underway right now. So again, you've got a lot of activity going on right now. So something to be very proud of in Apple Valley. Our Orchard Place Master Design, again, this is something that we're still working on with the, with the developers and also the owners of the site. We're very excited to also uh, point out that uh, Currently underway, as pointed out by uh, uh, planner uh, Alex Sharp, was that we just approved uh, a new outdoor seating area for the Lones and Byerleys. Again, this is a, about a 45,000 square foot facility. I think it's one of it's going to be state of the art. This is very nice architecture, four sided. I love it. Uh, also, Texas Roadhouse, uh, the Mr. Car Wash, uh, fully open. Uh, I just took these pictures today. We also have Chipotle. Newt, Sweet Treasuries, Crisp and Green, Punch Pizza. So you got a, a whole wide variety of, of uses going on in this area. Uh, the Obsidian Cobble Street Strip Mall. This is a 5,000, just under 5,100 square foot mall. I don't know if they have any occupants or tenants yet, but uh, again, a very nice addition to that area. Shoe or Shoes at 15,560 English. This is about an 8,000 square foot retail building, hopefully for shoes. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. That's why I love these guys. <laughs> they, they, they laugh at my, my inside jokes. Health Partners Clinic. Uh, this is a new two-story, 56,000-square-foot building. So, again, a key, key play, uh, a key part of this was keeping health partners in the community. Even though they're moving, uh, we still want to work with them and try to see if we can repurpose or redevelop their old site. But, again, this is a nice little facility, a nice addition here. Uh, Apple Valley Square Mall, we have Chase Banks and Popeyes, so uh, yay, another chicken's place. But I love Popeyes, so I'm very happy to see this. This Chase Bank, I, I know, has very, been very busy, very active. 
Uh, I love this diagram. I hope that's shown up good on your screen, but this is the Cider Ridge uh, Caribou Coffee place that uh, Kathy just uh, went over. Again, I didn't know, I, I hadn't seen this until I put this together, so this is phenomenal. This is going to be a nice little feature on that little corner in front of the church. Not to take away from the beauty of that little church there, but this is going to be a real uh, 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 eye-catching piece right there in that corner. Apple Valley Lincoln. Some of you may have discovered the old, I believe they referred to it as the old auto mall. It's being torn down, taken down right now. They're, they're grinding everything up, they're recycling all the things. Good for them. In place of that will be this new Apple Valley Lincoln dealership. Again, a very nice facility. We're excited. We, 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 we got some issues worked out on their plat today. We're very excited that will be moving forward. Again, the Homshuck and Bodega 42. I'm sorry this picture is a little not that great, but it does show the impact or, or the continuing construction going on over there at the corner of Galaxy 152nd. Again, this will be for that uh, Mercado type restaurant market with Butcher Deli Production Warehouse. Floor and Decor. This is uh, the redevelopment of that former AMC theater site. 80,000 square foot floor and material store. I know these are becoming uh, widespread throughout the nation. These are huge uh, uh, stores for that purpose, for floor and decor. If you want to aggravate yourself outside of golf and you want to bring it inside, this is what X Golf is going to be at the Times Square. This will be allow you to play indoor golf also enjoy some nice food, some drinks, and some gathering space. Also, an outdoor patio that uh, we talked about before. On the industrial developments, we have our Scannell and Opus sites. The 113,000 square foot about on the up, uh, right next to Abdala, and across from Upanor, the 117,000 square foot. And again, just some images that show what those are planned to be looking like. The fire station number two, again. I think our fire department is always excited, not only when they get their new fire trucks, but when they get their new fire stations. This is going to be a, a, a grand building in place of what they have out there today, so I hope uh, this is going to be a real exciting feature for them as well. Our central maintenance facility, again, this was just re approved by our council, so they plan to remove some existing st warm storage building, add some fleet maintenance, vehicle storage, some office space, so again, just a few images that show that. Eagle Brook Church, uh, I believe this was a part of a repurposing of the old Menards uh, store. Still some room left over, but again, I believe this is, has been open and is just currently uh, conducting services. Applewood Point, 1244 Pilot Knob. This is a 98 senior co-op with seven townhomes. Nice looking feature. I really like this building. This is, uh, I hope you're very proud to see the, the architecture on this. I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of, of horizontal stone and the, and, and the recession here uh, on, the, on the faces and, and the outdoor patio. So, again, this is Riser of Apple Valley, uh, fantastic uh, architecture. Our Eagle Point on the former Apple Valley Golf Course, uh, uh, a very dense, tight site, but they managed to put in 78 lots with 27 single-family villas, attached townhomes, and one single-family lot. Uh, one key part of this is we're also adding a number of stormwater features to help with the area drainage in this area. And this is also sort of a joint developer and city project going on here. Uh, with that, uh, I wrapped up very quickly. I hope uh, if you have any questions, I'll defer them to my crack staff. Otherwise, we're asking you to approve this plan or this, this annual report and authorize staff to bring it to the, your city council. Are there any questions? Great job. Thank you. Everyone. Yeah, we were busy last year. You were. Job. Pleasure of the commission. Madam Chair, I recommend we approve the 2022 Planning Commission Annual Report and authorize city planning staff to present said report to the city council. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Schindler and seconded by Commissioner Diekman. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. With that, is there a motion to end? So moved. Second. Motion made by Commissioner Schindler and seconded by Commissioner Scanlan. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. This meeting is adjourned. Aye.